Well, I invite you to turn to Exodus chapter 4 this morning in your Bible, your electronic device. Maybe you have a new I, a G5 or whatever they are that uh, you stood in line for this week. In Exodus chapter 4 and uh, verses 18 to 31 this morning, and I introduce it that way this morning because if you have by chance read ahead and you are familiar with the verses that are coming to us today, then you will understand why I was very tempted to just go into chapter 5 and we would just find Moses uh, all of a sudden back down in Egypt doing his thing before Pharaoh and the people of Egypt. But we are not going to do it that way. But in this chapter, this section that comes to us this morning, uh, it's somewhat uh, anticlimactic to what we just saw in the previous section. I mean, in the previous section, it's almost in many ways the high point of, uh, of Exodus because God has this encounter uh, with Moses. Moses has this encounter with God, the burning bush, the voice from the bush, the miracles, the signs, the wonders that Moses is empowered to do. All of this happens. And on top of all of that, you have the declaration by God that he's the great I am. So you have this pinnacle in many ways in the, pre- in the previous section. And so it's a little bit anticlimactic as we come to these verses this morning. But more than that, these are very challenging verses. Uh, some would suggest that they're the most challenging in the book of Exodus. So uh, with that in mind, we're going to jump in and look at this because Moses ends his self-imposed exile in Midian and he finds, him, uh, he finds uh, his way back down to Egypt And uh, these verses are going to maybe stretch our theological acumen a little bit, but that's okay. Let's do that. Let's start off with something easy, though, all right? Let's start off with the big idea. The big idea of the passage this morning, when you trust God completely, you know what He is going to do? He is going to guide us perfectly, and so we're to rest in the promises of God. That's a pretty uh, basic way to begin, isn't it? Let's continue on something kind of easy, and let's do the review. That's easy, too. And in the review, you remember, we've, we divided up Moses' life into four parts. And you have the 40 years of uh, his time in Egypt. You have 40 years in Midian. And then you have 40 years uh, when he's in the wilderness. And as you look at that, we're beginning this last section. So we're, we're now in the last section as he's going to be making his way back down to Egypt. And then very soon after, he's going to find himself leading God's people in the wilderness But as you look at those stages and how they unfold, chapters 1 and 2 really covered the first 40 years of his life. We don't have a whole lot there, do we? Chapters 2 and 3 covered the 40 years of his time in Midian. Again, we don't have very much there, do we? And so the rest of the book from this point forward is going to be talking about Moses in this uh, place of being God's uh, leader for his people. And that brings us to how we see his life unfold in the different ways that the different roles that Moses took on. When he was in Egypt, he was a prince, wasn't he? And as a prince, uh, we could either say it this way, he was something. In fact, he was something pretty special because he was royalty. Or we could say it uh, that he was learning something, certainly was. He was trained in the, the best schools that Egypt had to offer. Then he goes into Midian and he becomes a shepherd. And so in terms of socioeconomic, for sure from the the vantage point of the Egyptians, he goes from the top to the bottom in one fatal sweep. And in that role, he's really learning that he's nothing. He's learning uh, this absolute dependency that he needs to have on God. And then when we get to this final section in the wilderness, he's learning the most important lesson maybe of all, that God is everything. And when you... uh, go on that journey, which all of us do. And and right now, we're at different stages, perhaps, aren't we, in terms of where we find ourselves on that continuum. Let's look then at uh, God's will, God's way, and we're going to start off in verses 18 through 20 by looking at some final words that Moses uh, gives. And we begin at verse 18, then Moses departed and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, please let me go, then I may return to my brethren who are in Egypt. And see if they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. Now the Lord said to Moses in Midian, Go back to Egypt, for all the men who are seeking your life are dead. So Moses took his wife and his sons and mounted them on a donkey, and he returned to the land of Egypt. Moses also took the staff of God in his hand. So you have here some final words that Moses uh, gives to us. And and the first one is to his father in law, right? He's going to speak to his father in law, and he has a word to his father in law. Uh, he is no doubt um, 
hours and hours, maybe days away from, from his family. As he's out with the sheep, and remember he went over to the, to the Mount of God uh, to get to a place evidently of grazing and, and better pasture. And so it's at that place that he has the encounter with God. Well, now he has to go back. And so we're not told how far away he was, but we would assume that he was some distance away. And so he's got to make the journey back either for many, many hours or perhaps even for a number of days. He's going back to Jethro, uh, who was also, remember, referred to as uh, Reuel. But here he's referred to as Jethro. Jethro is his father-in-law, but Jethro is also his employer. It's his boss. And so, uh, you know, we have a little principle here that he's giving notice, right? He's going back to his employer, who happens to be his father-in-law, and he's going to say, uh, Dad, uh, Jethro, Reuel, whatever, uh, I'm giving notice, and I'm going to be taking a different job. And so he's uh, communicating this information to uh, his family. You notice what he doesn't say? He doesn't say anything at all about the mission, does he? He says, I'm going to go back down and see if my family is okay. And that's a perfectly legitimate concern, isn't it? I mean, his parents may very well have been dead by now. We're 40-plus years after he had left. Uh, so it's possible that uh, that was a, a heavy burden. I'm sure it was. But it's interesting that he doesn't say anything at all about the mission. I mean, here he has had this incredible encounter. And as people try to think through this, and it's just creative thinking at this point because we're not told why, some have suggested, well, maybe he was still wondering if he was going to do this. Maybe he was still struggling with the doubts and the issues in his mind. I think it's more likely that he's wondering, what would Jethro say if I told him everything that just happened to me? Yeah, I just got back from this distant place uh, by this mountain, and I saw this bush that was burning, and it wasn't burned up, and a voice talked to me, and and it was God who was talking to me, and my staff became a serpent. And, you know, about that time, Jethro is looking at him, and maybe he's thinking, wow, a little too much time in the sun for Moses here on this last venture, right? So it might be that he just didn't want to go into all that. We don't know. We're not told. But he doesn't say anything at all about that. Here's what we do know. We know that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, doesn't it? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And so, right on cue, we come to verse 19, right? And we have a word from God. Now the, now the Lord said to Moses in Midian, Go back to Egypt, for all the men who are seeking your life are dead. You know, just in thinking of his conversation with Jethro and then this word from God, I, I think it's a fair observation to say sometimes there's real value in demonstrating our faith and not just talking about it all the time, right? Sometimes there's real value in demonstrating our faith. Sometimes there's real value in people just seeing our faith in action. Now, we got to keep that in, in, in balance because it doesn't mean we never speak about our faith. But you and I both know that there are people who the way that they seem to conduct themselves is they're always talking about their faith but sometimes there's not the consistency with the walk as there is with their talk. And, and it seems we need to keep both of those tensions in mind, don't we? Uh, the, the statement that says, preach the gospel, and if, by, and if you need to, use words, misses it. Because you got to use words. That's why God communicated His Word to us. You have to have both. And so here's Moses, as he's living this call out before his father-in-law and his family, is finding perhaps something of that balance between those two, but, but this revelation that God gives him in verse 19, I, I see this as really the beginning now of his return to Egypt. This is, the, this is the point at which he drives the stake into the ground, and we're really, the Exodus mission is on. And then you notice the authority that he has. He has a symbol of authority in verse 20. So Moses took his wife and his sons and mounted them on a donkey, and he returned to the land of Egypt. Moses also took the staff of God in his hand. Whether hesitatingly or not, he's on the road of obedience. He's on the way. The whole family initially goes down to Egypt. We know that Zipporah and the sons go back to Midian because they're not there during the Exodus. They're going to meet up with Moses and the children of Israel later. So somewhere in this place, 
they go back. But initially, the whole family is in, and they're going down to Egypt together. And he has in his hand his staff. But notice the, it's changed, isn't it? It's not his staff. In the previous section, it was his staff. And God said, take your staff and throw it on the ground, and it became a snake. But it's not his staff anymore. Now, in fact, it is called the staff of God. And I think that's kind of interesting. It's a symbol of authority to Moses. It's a symbol of power. It's not something magical. We don't want to read into this and say, oh, he's got some kind of a magical tool. He's got something magical in his hand. No, what he has is a symbol in his hand of God's authority and, and really of God's saving power. What, what would we have today? What would be a, a comparative today to us for us to say, this is a symbol in my life of God's power. This speaks into my life of God's authority. What would we say that we had? I think we would say the Word of God, wouldn't we? We would certainly say we have the Word of God. It speaks, obviously, with authority and power into our life. We would certainly, I think, say that we have the Holy Spirit of God who lives and dwells within us and is a reminder to us of who it is that we're depending on and, and what we're trusting in. But I think to be even more specific, it is, in fact, the message of the cross and the message of the gospel that is this sign to us today. I think that is the, the indicator to us today of God's authority, of God's power to do what he did in the life of Moses. Paul says as much about this sign in Romans 1.16, remember, when he says in that familiar verse, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why not, Paul? Because it's the power of God unto salvation. The cross is a symbol of God's grace, of God's mercy, of God's power, of God's deliverance, isn't it? Of God's rescue, of His liberation in our life. And, and Paul, remember, we, we referenced this last week in 1 Corinthians 1, for indeed Jews ask for signs, but Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews it's a stumbling block, and to Gentiles it's foolishness, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. We have the cross, and we have the message of the cross, and we have the message of the gospel. I've got to speak into something that's happening in our city this week. I believe it's this week. Joel Osteen is coming up. I think it's this weekend. And I just feel compelled as a shepherd of sheep to speak to these kinds of things occasionally. Because whatever else he stands for, he stands for a man who in my reading and listening to him seems very much to think that he can come up with words of authority and power for his life and for other people apart from the Word of God. He's got a new book that's out now, something about words that empower your life. And he was on CNN this past week, and he shared the time with uh, Deepak Chopra, or Chopra, who was an Eastern mysticist guy. And it was almost like there wasn't any real difference between these two guys. And he was asked specific questions about things going on in our world, in our culture, things that Somebody that's relying on the authority of the Word of God and the power of the gospel to change people's lives would just normally run to, to speak about those issues. You know what he said? He said, I, 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 can, I will talk about those things on a program like this. I don't talk about them in my church. And then he said, and I quote, I stay in my lane. I stay in my lane when I'm in my church because I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want anybody to get a negative thought going in their head. I don't want to push anybody down, he said. What in the world do we have to offer people apart from the power of the cross and the power of the gospel to change their life? You can't come up with 31 words to, to empower your life and to bring life change. That's why when he leaves and he goes to Egypt, he has in his hand no longer his staff. He has in his hand the staff of God that's going to be a reminder to him every day. This is the power that God has invested in this mission. And it's not me. 
And it's not my words and it's not my thoughts. I, I just think that's very instructive for us. Let's look then secondly at some difficult words, all right? So the easy stuff is over. Now it's time that we hunker down and we get to get into some of the more difficult things. In verses 21 to 23, and we're going to start off by uh, noticing this whole matter of miracles again. Verse 21, and the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders which I have put in your power, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let my people go. The signs, remember, we learned in chapter 4, verses 1 through 9, the signs were for the leaders of Israel, the elders of Israel, and for God's people, but it's not limited to that. It's going to also be assigned to the people of Egypt, and in particular, it's going to be assigned to Pharaoh. So God enlarges upon this assignment, if you will, and he says, you know what? These signs are for the elders of Israel, but they're also for the people of Egypt, and in particular, you're going to do these things before Pharaoh to get his attention and for him to know that you are for me. How is he going to respond? And God says at the end of verse 21, uh, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let my people go. And that brings us to a somewhat difficult issue, doesn't it? I'm going to harden his heart so that I will not let, uh, he will not let my people go. This is a picture of the sovereignty of God, okay? We're stepping in, in this verse, to the doctrine of the sovereignty of God. And the sovereignty of God is one of the most comforting, one of the most uh, powerful, one of the most reassuring messages that the Scriptures give to us, I believe. And in this instance, we are confronted with the fact that God is sovereign, He is king, He's ruler, He's Lord over all. In fact, you could argue in many ways that the book of Exodus is, is really highlighting, isn't it, time after time, the doctrine of the sovereignty of God. He is sovereign over creation. We learned that in Genesis 1 and 2. He's sovereign over providence in terms of how he oversees and arranges the lives of his people. That's all the way through the book of Genesis, getting us really to the book of Exodus. And in the book of Exodus, we're going to learn that he's sovereign in salvation. God is sovereign. He is ruler. He is king. He is Lord over all. This book, in many ways, is the battle of the gods, isn't it? The one true God and the gods of Egypt. And the, and the question that's going to be ultimately answered is, who is king? Who, who, can, who really calls the shots? Who is in charge? Who is in control? And here's what I want you to see. This whole matter of God hardening Pharaoh's heart and Pharaoh being responsible for God is, in my mind, a both-and thing, okay? It's both-and. The Bible is clear that God is sovereign. The Bible is equally clear that human beings are are responsible before God, all right? We are not robots because God is sovereign. We are not automatons because God is sovereign. But then you say, well, explain all of that to me. And I say, well, I can't do that. But the Bible has that tension of the fact that God is king, that he's ruler, that he's sovereign, that he's over all, and that you and I are accountable and responsible before him, and we have the freedom to make choices, we're going to read as we go along here some 20 times the statement that Pharaoh's heart is hardened. And here's what I want you to see. Some of those times it's going to say that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Chapter 8, verse 15, it's going to say, Pharaoh hardened his heart before God. God said, let my people go. Pharaoh said, I will not, and he hardened his own heart. And then we're going to read a number of times that, Pharaoh, uh, that Pharaoh's heart was hardened. And we're not told the specifics of how it was hardened. And then we're going to read a number of times that God hardens Pharaoh's heart. All of those things are true within the doctrine of the sovereign purposes of God. Now, why do you suppose when we come to this statement, why do you suppose that God tells Moses ahead of time you're going to go down there. You're going to perform these signs. You're going to do these wonders in front of Pharaoh. And he's not going to let my people go. His heart is going to be hardened. Why, why did God tip his hand and tell Moses before he ever went what was going to have to happen for this release to take place? I think, first of all, it is so that Moses would remember why he was going. 
he was going to be a bearer of the message to Pharaoh, let my people go. He was merely the messenger. And I think God was saying to Moses, your job is to focus on the message. Your job is to carry out the commission that you've been given. Your job is to declare to Pharaoh in every way that I tell you to, let my people go. I'm in charge of his heart. See? Moses doesn't have to get all stirred up. He doesn't have to be all anxious about whether he can persuade or convince or conjole or do all of that. No, Pharaoh, you need to know going down, this man's heart is in my hands. And I think it's also just as a part of that to encourage him in this process, to encourage him that God is in control. It would be very easy, as we're going to see, right out of the gate. When, when Pharaoh says, oh, you want, to, you want to do it this way? Well, then don't give the people any mud or any straw. And life becomes exceedingly that much more difficult. Well, that's right off the bat. Moses is going to need the encouragement of God as he goes through this process. But mostly he needs to know that the matter of heart change is what God does. And so it's this both and thing. This is also a mystery, my friends, isn't it? This is also a mystery. This idea that is taught here and elsewhere is not a contradiction. This is not somehow a puzzle that we're to solve in our own mind. I, I don't think you can get there. You're going to make your head hurt if you try to figure out how is it that God is sovereign and yet He holds you and I accountable and responsible for our choices and decisions. God doesn't reveal that tension to us. He does show us how it works itself out. He shows us what it looks like. In, in Acts 16, 14, Paul comes to Philippi, and there's a group of ladies meeting by the river, and he shares the gospel, and it says he gives them the message of the gospel, right? That's what he was to do. He was just to give the gospel, and he gave the gospel. And what does it say? Acts 16, 14. And the Lord opened her heart, and she received the gospel. That's what God does. The heart is God's issue. Our responsibility is the message and living out the message. And God will handle the opening of the heart of people to that. He states it ever so clearly in Romans 9. We won't take the time to turn there, but you may want to jot down Romans 9. It's as clear as it can be stated. And to the extent that we can grasp and understand this mystery, it's laid out there for us. Someone has said, this is a paradox of divine sovereignty and human responsibility, which is not a puzzle to be solved, but a mystery to be adored. So Pharaoh's going to harden his heart against the will of God. His heart is going to be hardened against the will of God, and God is going to harden his heart against his will. Verses 22 and 23 tell us then why it is that this is going to happen. This special relationship, would you notice the, the specialness of this relationship? Then you shall say to Pharaoh, after he just said he's going to harden his heart and he's not going to let my people go, then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I said to you, let my son go that he may serve me, but you have refused to let him go. Behold, I will kill your son, your firstborn. Wow, this takes us right to the very heart of the story of Exodus. And it really unfolds itself in the rest of Scripture because this special relationship that God has with His people, it's called His electing grace. Israel is my firstborn son, He says. What does it mean to be God's firstborn son? This language repeats itself in the New Testament when it's talking about us. We're the sons and daughters of God. We're in His family by faith. We're accepted into the beloved. We're adopted as His children. All of this language continues in different forms in the New Testament. But he's talking here about the fact that we are in a place of privilege as the people of God, as the children of God. We're in a place of status, if you will. We're the, we are the recipients of the double blessing because we're a part of this special relationship that he refers to as his firstborn son. And it speaks to why it is that God is determined to rescue Israel from the land of Egypt. We read, for instance, in Hosea chapter 11, and verse 1, where the prophet said, When Israel was a youth, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. When he was as a youth in Egypt, I loved him. That's a special love that God has for his children. To Pharaoh, what were the children of Israel to Pharaoh? 
they, they were slaves at the, at the best of his description. He would say that's slave labor. At worst, he would say they're expendable. He was in a, he was in a, uh, uh, a, a program of genocide against them. So he had the exact opposite viewpoint and perspective that God had. And God said, uh, you need to know, you're messing with my children. These are my own who I call by name. And he tells us, and it, as hard as it is to see this and to read this, he tells us ahead of time the terrible judgment that's going to come against Pharaoh and Egypt to bring them to the point that they let God's people go. So from those difficult verses about the sovereignty of God and human responsibility and impending judgment, we come to some enigmatic verses, all right? If you look up the word enigmatic in the dictionary, it says that it is something that is mysterious, something that is puzzling, something that is baffling, something that is perplexing, and something that is inexplicable. So my assignment now is to explain to you the inexplicable and to unscrew the inscrutable, all right? Are you with me? We're going to try this. Because in verses 24 through 26, these verses, when we read them, remind us of how strange the Old Testament can be and how foreign some of the things that happen seem to us. Now, it came about at the lodging place on the way that the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. Then Zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and threw it at Moses' feet. And she said, you are indeed a bridegroom to, uh, of blood to me. So he let him alone. At that time, she said, you are a bridegroom of blood because of circumcision. See why I wanted to go to chapter 5? <laughs> These verses are baffling, aren't they? They're, they're strange. But they're here as a part of Scripture. And so there's got to be something that God wants us to learn about this. What's going on in that group of verses? Well, Moses and Zipporah and their sons are on their way down to Egypt. They stop at Motel 6 a couple of nights into it, right? And that evening, Moses is incapacitated. Something happens to him, and, and as strange as it seems, we read in the text that it specifically said God was trying to kill him. Now, you talk about strange, right? This is the man that God prepared, called, commissioned, and is now, whether hesitating or in full obedience, he's on his way to Egypt to do the very thing that God called him to do, and that was to be the deliverer. And we read in the text that the deliverer is about to be killed by God. We aren't given any details of how this unfolds, but it seems in the story that Moses cannot respond, and so Zipporah, his wife, Evidently, she knew what it was that might help in this situation. This is open to a lot of speculation as to what that might mean. We'll comment on it just briefly in a moment. But she comes to his rescue. She circumcises one of the sons, and Moses recovers. Now, I ask you, what does this mean? Well, here is some background. You remember in the book of Genesis... When God called Abraham, who was a Gentile, and he said, Abraham, you're going to be my man. And from you, Abraham, I'm going to bless all the peoples of the earth, and I'm going to make your name great, and I'm going to give you and your people a land. And God established in Genesis 17 what we call the covenant relationship with Abraham. It's the Abrahamic covenant. Abraham was saved in Genesis 15 when we read in verse 6. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. So that's when Abraham trusted God as, as his Savior. And then when you get to Genesis 17, God tells uh, Abraham the sign of this covenant is going to be the act of circumcising every male child on the eighth day when they are born. And it is going to be that sign and that symbol and that act of circumcision that is going to mark out you as my people, both physically and spiritually, as being a part of the covenant family of God. It's not salvation, but it was an act of obedience, and in that act of obedience, you were in effect saying, my family is part of the covenant family. Well, get this, 
Somewhere along the way, Moses forgot to obey, right? Somewhere along the way, Moses let this issue slip, and one of his sons had not been circumcised. So in effect, that son was outside of the covenant family and was not in a place to enjoy the blessing of God. And so here is Zipporah, and she takes this upon herself, seeing, Ab- uh, seeing uh, Moses' distress, she circumcises the son, and Moses recovers. And what we have indicated to us here, at least some have suggested, is that Zipporah, being a Midianite and not a Hebrew, was opposed to this circumcision act even taking place. We don't know that. And it really isn't that relevant to the story because Moses is, uh, Ab- uh, Moses is the one who is being held accountable, isn't he? It's he who is the head of his family and is to make sure that they are doing the things that God has called them to do. So why is this important? Let me suggest three things as to the importance of this story within this story. First of all, it underscores the importance of obedience. We don't, we don't want to read these verses and be left confused about this point. Because this is, if it's nothing else, it underscores the importance of obedience. Events like this speak to the importance of obeying God. It's so very easy in my life for me to become casual about obeying God. It's so easy in my life for me to to fall into a mindset where I, I just kind of pick and choose the things that I decide I want to obey. And yeah, okay, yeah, they're not the really, really bad things, of course. Those are easy for most of us, most of the time, to avoid. But it's the other things that we just decide on our own. We're not going to do that, really. God has commanded us in no uncertain terms, in all of these imperatives, these are the things that you're to do. And, and, and we just decide whether we're going to do them or not. So I think this passage should cause us to sit up and say partial obedience with God is just like full of disobedience. And it is especially important for leaders to see that when God calls you into that realm, you had better acknowledge this extra need of dependency on God to be fully vested in the things that He's called us to do and be. We're not perfect. We fail every day that we better be committed to obedience. I think secondly, just as the flip side of this, it speaks to the seriousness of disobedience. It speaks to the seriousness of disobedience. It's a picture of the holiness of God. It's a picture of the holiness of God. God does not look lightly on sin. This is an area that Moses had willfully, deliberately, knowingly just decided he didn't need to do this. And, and before he can be the leader that God wants him to be in in Egypt and taking the forefront of leading the people out. He has got to get this area of his life in order. And then the last thing I notice is this is a focus on the provision of forgiveness. This is an amazing little snapshot of this whole matter of forgiveness. And you notice that a couple of times Zipporah speaks of him as a blood bridegroom. Uh, And it was really through her action that deliverance and rescue of Moses came about. She says, in effect, in doing this act of circumcision on her son, she is in effect saying, let the one take the place of the other. And that's what forgiveness entails. There is this act in which she speaks back to Moses of being a blood bridegroom which has even some implications, doesn't it, with regard to the shedding of blood. I think the only other thing I would add to this uh, little part of the story is this. Sometimes blind spots that we have are best seen by others, aren't they? And that's the value of having a, a husband or wife who will be willing to step into your life. And, and that's the importance of hearing your husband or wife, speak that truth into your life. We don't know how that was working in this relationship, but it is simply true, isn't it? That sometimes we don't see the blind spots that other people see. And and when someone brings that to us, we need to prayerfully consider. Doesn't mean everybody that brings us a blind spot is right. 
but we need to carefully consider what they might say. Then very quickly, just in a, in a very brief uh, mention of verses 27 to 31, we have some reassuring words, and, and I am going to just briefly comment on these. The first one is just as you would expect. Verses 27, 28, and 29, we have these two brothers. They haven't been together for 40 years, and they, they, they reunite, and, and you know that there were all kinds of stories and tears and hugs, and all of that was going on uh, just as we would have expected. In verses 30 and 31, it's just as God has promised. Look at verse 30. And, and Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses, then he performed the signs in the sight of the people, so the people believed, just as God said. God said, you go down there, and I'll let you take Aaron with you, but your people, my people, they're going to believe what you have to say, and it, it happened, just as God said. He is faithful to his word, isn't he? And then notice thirdly, just as God intended, verse 31, so the people believed, and when they heard that the Lord was concerned about the sons of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, then they bowed low and they worshiped, just as you would expect. The people of God, just as God intended this promise-keeping God, the people respond back and worship. When you trust in the Lord completely, he will guide you perfectly, and that's why we need to rest on, hold on to uh, this word and, and what he has given to us in Scripture. Two things to close here, uh, and I'm going to begin with point B, all right? I'm going to flip these around. God's work done in God's way always results in God's blessing. This is the beginning of this story now as, as Moses is now uh, on this path of obedience and he's doing it God's way and he's following God's will and, and God is the one who's going to direct his steps. And it is going to uh, unfold in a totally different way than the first time when he tried it on his own. And that's the way God works in our lives. We follow his plan. We follow his purposes. We do things the way he has called us to and there is blessing. And then finally, would you notice that obedience is always what God is looking for from us. So we're back to this theme of obedience. That is to be our first response to God's command. So as we think in terms of our walk with God, as, as, as the Word speaks into our life, as we need to value that day to day and invite the Holy Spirit to say, what is it that I need to hear? What is it that I need to see? What is it that, God, that you want to show me today? And then the, 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 the immediate step that is required of us is one of obedience. This is a matter of obedience, gathering around the Lord's table. This isn't, this isn't a matter of convenience. This isn't a matter of, well, if I'm there that Sunday, then fine. If I'm not, well, I'll do it the next time. No, this is a command. When we come together as the people of God, we're to break this bread to drink this cup together because that's what God has commanded us to do. Baptism, like circumcision, isn't for salvation. But you know what? It's a command that God has given. Christians aren't supposed to pick and choose in the book which ones they want to do and which ones they don't want to do. When God has said it, He expects us to do it, doesn't He? He wants us to obey. And when we obey, there's blessing. And when we disobey... There's discipline. That's the faithfulness of our God. I want to read as we transition to this time of communion. I'm going to read from Psalm 51. And it's this wonderful Psalm of David that brings into picture this matter of obedience and confession and forgiveness and God's provision. And then when I'm done reading, I'm going to pray and the men are going to come, and we're going to receive the offering, all right? So our first act of worship after I read and pray will be to give. And then immediately following that, the elders and deacons are going to come, and we're going to disperse the bread and the cup. And we're going to do all of this without break. We're going to just simply invite the Holy Spirit of God to speak into our life things that He wants to have us hear and uh, just make this a time of unbroken worship. Psalm 51, be gracious to me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the greatness of thy compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only I have sinned and done what is evil in thy sight, so that thou art justified when thou dost speak and blameless when thou dost judge. 
Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, thou dost desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden part thou wilt make known thy wisdom. Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear the joy and gladness. Let the bones which thou hast broken rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all of my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors thy ways and sinners will be converted to thee. This table represents in the bread and in the cup this very matter of God's forgiveness of our sins. It speaks to the greatest deliverance and the greatest liberation that can ever be known and accomplished. And that is the liberation and the deliverance of a sinner out of that place of separation from God into a place of acceptance as one of his children. And if you do not know God in that way this morning, if you do not know Jesus as your personal Savior, that's our gift to you, if you will, this morning. That's the gift of the gospel. That's what we want you to understand and to know, that your sins can be forgiven. You can be washed clean, and you can be made into a new person in Christ by simply agreeing with God as it relates to his son Jesus and what he did on the cross when he died there for you and for me. As a child of God by faith, as many of us are already here this morning, this is an opportunity to make sure that we too are walking in fellowship with our Lord. And it's always a great thing, isn't it, to be reminded that with God there are many new beginnings. And so we may need that very thing this morning to be reminded that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's pray. Gracious Father, here we are before you as your people. Father, here we are before you interceding on behalf of one or more that are here this morning that do not know what it means to have their sins forgiven, that may not be certain of where they will spend eternity. We pray, Lord of the heart, that you will open that heart. They will receive and believe the gospel of your grace, that it is not by working that we get to heaven. It is by the work of Christ. Father, for myself and for each of your children here this morning by faith, we are so very grateful that these times of worship and giving, these times of remembering through the bread and the cup are points of renewal and points of beginning that remind us of your faithfulness and love. We thank you for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.